Okay, so I'm going to introduce Bharati here. Um, she's going to explore the prevalence of heart disease among South Asians, particularly our Sydney community. We possess lifestyle factors and generic inheritance that makes us highly prone to major risks. While South Asians in general are predisposed to heart disease, specific Sydney lifestyle tendencies exacerbate the effect. She's going to teach us how to beat the epidemic with advice regarding nutrition, fitness, and early prevention. Uh, Bharati is a practicing physician assistant in cardiac surgery at Stanford University Medical Center. And in addition to assisting cardiac surgeons in the operating room and surgeries, such as coronary artery bypass, she also provides education and awareness for surgical patients, both preoperatively and postoperatively. So without further ado, Bharati. Thank you. Are you going to be okay? Okay, there we go. Okay, uh, thank you so much for the lovely introduction. Uh, my name is Bharti Daswani. I am a uh, physician assistant. I work at Stanford Hospital and Clinics in Stanford, California. So I've come all the way uh, from Cal Cali to enjoy the good Boston weather. So woohoo! <laughs> um, I have been a little bit about myself. I've been in practice as a cardiac surgery PA for about six years now, and uh, I, I really love my job. Uh, some of my duties as a cardiac surgery PA include uh, working in the operating room besides cardiac surgeons, um, helping them during the coronary bypass procedure. So while the surgeons are up at the chest, I'm down at the leg removing the phase <coughs> that's required to do these bypass procedures. Um, so I really love what I do in the operating room. Not only do I get to do fun stuff like that, it's fun for me, and probably not fun for the patient, but um, I really enjoy taking care of patients out on the wards as well. What I do is provide post-operative care and uh, provide some education and teaching before our patients go home. So a lot of my work is also, not only is it you know, doing surgeries and helping surgeons, it's also providing that education for our patients. Um, and this is, heart disease I think is something, it's a topic that I'm really passionate about. Uh, not only because it's uh, something that's prevalent in our Sydney community, it's prevalent across our South Asian community as well. And it's something that sort of hits home for me, and it was one of the reasons why I actually went into cardiac surgery as a PA, is because of you know, bad family history. Um, so I'm hoping to share some of my knowledge with you today. I'm really excited to share that. I'm really honored that YSA had given me this opportunity to do so. And I hope that uh, if anything, if you guys learn some early prevention strategies, I think it begins in our age, in our 20s and 30s. So if we can start you know, utilizing some good tips now on, we can be assured that we can lead long, healthy lives and heart healthy lives. So, so our agenda for today actually is going to be talking a little bit about like the problem, the statistics and problems of heart disease in our community um, and talking about some risk factors, what, what are changeable risk factors and what are not. And then we'll talk about ways to solve the problem through diet and fitness modification and then we'll sum it up with some early prevention strategies. Uh, I also do promise to have a, uh, three quizzes at the end, and they come with uh, some rewards. You get a $5 gift card to Starbucks, so you get some incentive to answering questions, so pay attention, okay? All right. So, when I talk about statistics and problems, go ahead, next slide. So, the, when I was gathering my talk together, I actually went through and uh, I, all my research that I got about um, heart disease in our community is through this book written by Dr. Enos. It's uh, called How to Beat the Heart Disease Epidemic Among South Asians. Dr. Enos is an Indian cardiologist who has been um, a forefather in pioneering some of the studies that have been done on uh, heart, not only on Indian uh, South Asians as a community. There's other data such as the Framingham data, which is uh, based on the famous uh, Framingham, Massachusetts data that looks at heart disease uh, the prevalence of heart disease amongst the Caucasian and other, I think in, that, in those studies there have been very little representation from the South Asian community. And Dr. Enos has actually done some really good studies on focusing just on our community. And I factor some of these into this because we all are Indian too. So. And uh, so getting to the heart of the matter, no pun intended. <laughs> Um, so the statistics and prevalence of heart disease in our South Asian community is that there is a four to, what, what the studies that were done was a landmark study called the CADI trial, C-A-D-I, it's called coronary artery disease in Indians. So this is the first trial that was done that looked at heart disease in South Asians, and these are the following stats that were found from that study. 
So in general, there was a two to four times higher rate of heart disease that's found in our population when you compare us to everybody else across the board. And why that's so? Because there's been found to be increased number of uh, patients that have abdominal obesity, so that's increased weight around the midline, so-called the apple shape, you, may, you guys may have heard about that. Um, there's also high levels of insulin resistance. What that means is that your insulin basically is uh, pumping out more and more, uh, your body is unable to utilize insulin ineffectively, so as a result the pancreas keeps putting out more and more insulin, and there's high levels of insulin and glucose circulating in the bloodstream. And one of the insulin's uh, jobs is to actually transport the glucose back into the cells where it belongs. So, so you, that's been found in our, uh, that's what we have in our genes. And add to that, if you take abdominal obesity, if you take insulin resistance, you also get a high level, higher number of people who have metabolic syndrome. This is kind of like patients who have like the pre-diabetes picture. They may have like one or more risk factor, but they're not really uh, formally diagnosed as a diabetic, but sort of are on their way to be diagnosed as a diabetic or with someone with, um, so they've, they've found like higher levels of heart disease in those in that population too. Um, something that this uh, trial found was that there was a high rate of coronary artery disease that was found regardless of religion, um, gender, like male versus female. So even though like uh, heart disease is actually a silent killer in women postmenopausal. Um, the estrogen premenopause actually protects us from developing heart disease prematurely. But if you're an Indian or if you're Cindy, if you're a female, you're just at, you're just basically screwed. <laughs> sort of. I hate to say it, ladies, but you know, it's sort of it's, it's just something that's against us. But I'll talk about positive ways as to how to fight that. So be, uh, stay tuned. And there was high levels of um, highest rate, even regardless of socioeconomic background. So what that looked into was. Um, finding like high rates of uh, heart disease amongst people who are educated. Now, everybody in this room, I, you know, at least holds a bachelor's degree. You know, we are well educated. Our generation is much more well educated than our forefathers and our grandparents. But still, like you know, there is a high rate of heart disease. Now, why that's exactly so? We don't know. We possess some really uh, inflammatory markers that were more predisposed to developing heart disease. And I think more as more and more studies are done we'll be able to find out exactly why and how to control it or even like be very aggressive about treating heart disease even pre, uh, before any signs or symptoms. So this last piece I thought was interesting is that there is a four times higher rate of heart disease in India today. Uh, no surprise there, that's the largest population of Indians here um, in the world. And what there is is there's a doubled rate in rural areas and a threefold rate in urban areas. That is a big number, guys. So I think what that sort of accounts for is that the westernization coming to India, like the McDonald's and the Burger Kings and the Kentucky Fried Chickens of the world of America is coming to India, and they, um, many people want to go out and eat because they, they think it's novel, they think it's cool, you know. Um, add to that, like the boom that's occurring in India nowadays with people making, the middle class making more and more money, and you know, like I think many people have like so much money they don't know what to do with, so they're spending it, going out, just sort of, you know, following like the American lifestyle. Um, I know that when my husband and I, we traveled to India like just a year and a half ago, um, our family members like, oh, we can take you to McDonald's. They have like this paneer tikka wrap. I'm like, okay. <laughs> I'm like, um, thanks, but I prefer like Sai <laughs> You know, so like, you know, they, for them it's like this new thing, but for us, like, you know, it's already clogger and like, you know, it's just, it's just unhealthy and I think it's just so, it's time that we made a change, so. Um, so, ongoing with this study, what some, um, what I thought was interesting, what was found is a similar rate of heart disease between vegetarians and non-vegetarians. Now, you figure why so, like vegetarians eat like fruits and vegetables, yeah, it's a pretty healthy diet, but look at the way it's prepared. You know, things eat like pakoras, like vegetable pakoras, what are they, if they're fried. Um, if you look at the way that the you know, food is prepared, it's a uh, cream-based sauce, there's curries, you know, like all of that sort of it adds to the unhealthiness. And also, like many people I know, vegetarians eat like some kind of bhaji with like a roti or chapati or fulko, right? So if you make if you make that fulko from refined carbs, 
Refined carbs are something that it's, uh, the wheat itself has been stripped of its ger uh, I'm sorry, the wheat germs ha has been uh, stripped of its nutrients as a process, it's, it's been bleached, so basically it's been stripped of anything that's nutritious for you, and it's been, that's why it's bleached, because it's bleached white. And if you make it with white flour, then you're basically eating like a, um, there's no source of calories or no source of nutrients, essentially, it's empty calories, so. That's why there was a similar rate between vegetarian and non-vegetarian. Obviously, with the non-vegetarians, there's a higher rates of like you know meat intake and uh, eggs and dairy. So those are high sources of high cholesterol. So um, this point over here, this bullet here, I thought was really important, and uh, this is something I want to spend some time on. Is that when in our in our community, when heart disease appears. It often appears early, meaning less than 45 years of age. 45, that's scary. That is like, you know, in about like 20 years for me, you know, it, it just, this is just something that's been found. And it, when it does occur, it occurs hard, meaning that there's one, or, like usually it's like severe coronary artery disease, like patients have been diagnosed with like a triple vessel heart disease and have to undergo like emergency surgery for it. Often it's, oftentimes they're also fatal, they may die from it, and, and that's, you can't, there's extensive damage that's done to the heart muscle that patients cannot be revived. And it occurs unexpectedly. So either occurs without symptoms, like in women, it's silent killer, or if it occurs just with someone with like basically with no traditional one or two like risk factors but not really a lot of risk factors to account for it. And a good example that fits into this early hard and unexpected rule is actually my own mother. Um, when my mom, uh, when I was in PA school learning to become a PA, I uh, you know, I got, I had just started school and I was like in like the study, the clinical part of my uh, training and I got a phone call one day and I said, uh, my mom was on the phone and my dad said like, oh, you know, we're going to take your, we're going to take mom to the hospital. I said, what's going on? Is mom okay? So my mom, I, I just, she was having like some crushing chest pain and you know, my dad was really worried and he called 911 and they took her to the hospital and they did like an emergency coronary uh, angiogram and, they, and it was, she was found to have severe triple vessel heart disease and had to undergo emergency surgery that same night. So luckily she was like a little bit close by that I could travel there and be with her and I listened you know, from the surgeons and they said like, we have to do this on your mom. She's in, she, she was, at the time when she was diagnosed with this, she was 45. So this young, less than 45, is real. I can attest for that. And I'm sure if I ask you all, I'm sure you probably would know somebody that falls into that age range. And so, I mean, luckily at that time, she didn't suffer extensive damage to her heart muscle. She didn't, undergo, she didn't have heart, um, a heart attack. So they were able to do a triple vessel bypass surgery. And, um, and you know, she survived and she did well. And nowadays, like, it's, you know, she's, I uh, had to make a lot of diet and a lot of uh, modifications to her fitness. Um, I'm always on her back to you know, make sure she eats right and she's exercising. But you know, when you're older, it's really hard to break some habits. Some old habits die hard. So you know, it's, it's, it was just uh, something that I felt, um, well, it was actually one of the reasons why I actually did go into heart surgery was because of her, because I wanted to help other patients you know, survive, and you know, I saw how the surgeons helped my mom, but I also wanted to help my patients alongside with educating them, having them prevent them from having future events. So, and heart attack occurs about 10 years earlier than other populations, other age groups, and when the young, the less than 45 age group is diagnosed, there is a higher risk, higher risk than similar age groups in other populations. So if you're like a young, like 45-year-old city male, your risk of developing heart disease is actually higher than someone who's a 45-year-old African-American male. So this, this is very, um, you know, this is it's very, very important to you know, keep in mind. And one third of all heart attacks actually occur in those less than 45. Now why that's so with the aggressive, why such aggressive uh, development of heart disease, I think we still need to do ongoing studies and we still need to, like Dr. Enos has also definitely has been um, sort of pioneering some of these studies and hopefully over the years we'll sort of understand why this is so. Okay. So, so we're gonna talk
talk a little bit about like what we can do in terms of risk factors and how to change. Yeah. So, so since smoking is one of the risk factors, here's a physician actually advising his patient to quit smoking, but instead of wearing the nicotine patch on his shoulder, he wants to wear it over his mouth. You know, that's a source of a bad habit. <laughs> So when we talk about risk factors, um, there are some uh, risk factors that are a, that we can change and we cannot change. The ones we cannot change are our age. We can't change how old we get or, you know. Um, we can't change our gender. Well, I guess in today's day and age you probably can, but I'll save that for another talk. <laughs> um, obviously we can't change our genes, our family history of early heart attack or uh, death. And we can't change our ethnicity. And I, I am proud to say I'm Cindy, so I don't want to change that for the world, but I definitely will take all the um, steps that I need to keep myself heart healthy and you know, live a long, healthy life, so uh, that's my little piece on that. <laughs> and so the good news is there's a lot of risk factors that we actually can change. So we can change our cholesterol. If you have high cholesterol, there's ways to treat that with medications or with you know, diet and exercise modifications. Uh, if you're a smoker, you definitely uh, can stop smoking, and that'll sort of re that won't reverse your uh, rate of developing heart disease, but it can lower your risk because there's already some damage done. Depends on how long you've been smoking and all that. So we take that into consideration. And diabetes actually tends to be very, very common in Cindy's because of the abdominal obesity um, and the insulin resistance, like the metabolic syndrome that we talked about earlier. That tends to be very, very common amongst our population. Um, the rates of like definitely high blood pressure if you're diagnosed with hypertension, um, controlling your blood pressure, keeping your blood, blood pressures is, uh, under control is definitely uh, imperative. And abdominal obesity, which I mentioned, is also common in our population. And so the abdominal obesity and diabetes tend to go hand in hand. And stress and depression play a role uh, in, in, as a risk factor. And obviously lack of healthy diet and um, exercise will definitely, you know, you're definitely a sitting duck for developing heart disease if you're, you know, don't like incorporate some level of healthy eating and exercising in your life. And excessive alcohol, okay, we all love our Johnny Walker or beer, whatever have you, but you know, everything in moderation and if some amounts of alcohol, and I'll talk about specific types of alcohol, are actually can be good for you, so we'll sort of cover that a little later. But yeah, that's a, uh, those are the ways to uh, change it. And uh, so I want to talk a little bit about diabetes. <coughs> what I think is important is to keep this uh, equation in mind. So if you take abdominal obesity, the uh, weight around the midline, like the apple shape or so, add to that a sedentary lifestyle, and then add to that our diet, which is primarily like overconsumption of white rice, white flour, sugar, and refined carbs. Remember the refined carbs is like anything that's been stripped of its nutrient in the processing and uh, has been bleached to turn uh, the white color. So, so you get like an increased risk of diabetes and accelerated heart disease. So this, even though diabetes itself directly does not cause heart disease, but if you keep your blood sugars under, uh, if your blood sugars are not well controlled, uh, the diabetics tend to have higher levels of triglycerides and LD, low L, um, sorry, low HDL, that's the, that, uh, the good cholesterol. HDL is a good cholesterol, LDL is a triglyceride, uh, LDL is a low density lipoprotein, which is a bad cholesterol, you may have sort of heard about that. And the triglycerides are also, um, what happens is that when you intake too much carbs, and if you don't, so some level of carbs is actually good for you, they're good for the cells, and uh, if you do take too much of carbs in, all that carb sort of stays around and then gets turned into tri triglycerides as a result. And then if you have high levels of triglycerides, that also you know, contributes to having, um, and if you're diabetic, then it contributes to having a higher heart disease. And in our population, can you go to the next slide, uh, diabetes tends to develop 10 to 15 years earlier and at, a, and at a lower body weight, so we don't necessarily need to be massively obese in order to be diagnosed with the di with diabetes. And like I mentioned before, there's also a two to four times risk of having and dying from a heart attack. And complications are much more common and dangerous in women greater than men. Again, so if you're a Cindy woman, you're around the 45 age, you know, postmenopausal, you are diabetic, you know, that's just, it's very, very concerning. And um, especially with the family history. So this, this is why this is so important to change habits now. 
And same thing like, you know, patients do have heart disease, uh, I'm sorry, do have diabetes and have to have some procedure done too. And if they have heart disease and have to have some procedure done, um, oftentimes, depending on the severity of the heart disease, they, um, surgery or like a stent procedure can only do so much. Uh, surgery and stents, all these are not the cure itself either. You know, it's the ongoing changing of the mind over the matter, like changing your habits mentally and, you know, incorporating that will also definitely help lower your, um, you know, at least increase your, you know, survival and uh, success rate. So, um, I've had some patients that really had like maybe like one risk factor with, uh, you know, have to be, you know, have to undergo like triple vessel heart disease, um, triple vessel bypass, and, you know, like after surgery I see them and they did actually, you know, they did well, they were able to go home and they were able to recuperate and get back to, you know, living healthy and like for some people it's a, you know, a wake up call. They sort of wake up and they're like, you know, I'm going to change my life from now on, and, but it shouldn't take a surgery to really change that. You so what I think are some heart, I've listed some heart healthy foods about on the slide and which is, if you look up, if you Google, you know, heart healthy foods, you may get a list of something that may look something like this. So foods that are high in monounsaturated fats, monounsaturated fats are actually good because they're a good source of um, fatty acids that are actually responsible for lowering your bad cholesterol and increasing your good cholesterol. So, that, so you want to eat something like that because a good cholesterol protects you from developing heart disease. What, um, so there's components of heart disease that include not just cholesterol deposition, but also there's an inflammatory component as well that's involved. And with the monounsaturated fats, you lower the um, chance that the bad cholesterol will deposit in your coronary arteries. So olive oil is a great, great, um, you know, source of this sort of fat, and so is avocado. So those of you who are from California, avocados are sold at Safeway, so, you know, those are really good. I, I love avocados, so. <laughs> um, nuts are really good because they're good in the um, omega-3 fatty acids. Uh, they have, specifically like almonds, like sesame and pumpkin seeds are a good source. Again, like, you know, they're responsible for, um, they may also increase your high cholesterol, but they definitely are heart healthy. Beans are really good because um, they have like a lot of uh, protein. They have some fatty. They have some fatty acids as well, like especially like kidney beans, like garbanzo beans, like chole, like dal, like lentils, like kalachana. Those are really good because fiber is also good. With um, not only does it keep you regular, um, it also is a uh, can what it does is actually bind up the bad cholesterol and actually is, is, is soluble so you'll like pass it away so you'll, it'll lower your cholesterol that way and you'll lose weight too fiber is good for weight loss as well and uh, whole grains are really good because uh, they have um, antioxidants so the whole grain is like anything the part the whole part of the germ is there so like whole wheat bread or like you know the bread you say like whole grain flour or like whole grain like tortilla um, you know, that, you know, that has like, has retained its nutrients and has not been bleached, so you know you're getting the antioxidants. And what antioxidants are, they are um, uh, molecules that are responsible for eliminating toxins from your body, and they're anti-inflammatory, they protect again, not only against heart disease, but other inflammatory states like cancer, so it's really good for not just heart disease alone. Um, plus they're also responsible for creating great skin, so that's an added bonus, so. Uh, good intake of antioxidants will help you a lot uh, in many ways in one. And fish is a like, really good um, heart healthy food. Uh, I really, I love sushi and you know, I can't eat enough of it, but uh, I think like, a couple meals of fish a week, uh, as long as it's not fried, it's really good for you. And these are the types of fish that I think are more, um, especially salmon has high levels of uh, fatty acids, omega-3 fatty acids, you guys may have heard about this. And uh, you know, that's, really good to incorporate in your diet. And obviously fruits and vegetables are really good for you. Uh, the green leafy kind are good because of the antioxidants, high antioxidant source. And tea counts, uh, green tea has more, has the most level of antioxidants. Uh, does chai count? Um, yes and no, because it has, it does have some antioxidant component, but the milk sort of um, eliminates that. So that's why I, you know, if you drink black tea on its own, that also has a number of antioxidants, but uh, green tea sort of takes the 
cake when, you, when you're looking at tea. So go for the, if I were to go for the bang for the buck, I'd choose green tea. And I put red wine on here um, because uh, the antioxidant is also a great source of antioxidants. The red grape itself has a higher source of antioxidants, so that's why red wine is good. Now, do you need to drink the entire bottle in order to get the effects? Probably not. <laughs> so here's my uh, good rule of thumb. It's like one glass a day for women and one, uh, two glasses a day for men. Now, there have been studies that have been done that show that like, even like one to two glasses a week provide the same benefit. So, don't go, don't go crazy, okay? <laughs> and um, I did one thing I didn't put up on here because I didn't want to, I didn't want to condone this, but dark chocolate also has antioxidants. But uh, woo! So, ladies, you know when you're getting a gift from your uh, boyfriends, ask for dark chocolate, <laughs> especially the kind that has 70% dark chocolate. That's the best. It's bitter, but it's really good for you. But you don't eat the whole thing, though. One little piece. That's all you need and you'll get the benefits. <coughs> okay. Now, okay, so now we've talked a little bit about like what are the heart healthy foods. Now how do we incorporate some changes? So I made up this slide, um, like I sort of went through and I was thinking, going through my own cooking, like how do I like change, you know, how do I change my cooking tendencies or when I go out to dine, how do I change it so that I'm eating something healthy for myself? So instead of using like ghee, like butter or coconut oil in your cooking, like choose like olive oil, canola oil, or like benacol. Benacol is actually a um, plant-based uh, plant-based bread. Oh, back one. Okay. <laughs> uh, it's a plant-based bread. It's actually a, it's like a but it tastes like a buttery spread, but it's really good because it actually uh, lowers your it, it increases your high cholesterol, so it's beneficial for you. So instead of using like white rice, like choose like brown rice or couscous, you know, you can make like good like, you know, um, a meal out of that and it'll be really filling because it'll keep you full too. That's also one good thing of fiber, it keeps you full for a longer time so you don't need to eat a lot of food. So if you choose foods with high fiber content, you'll feel fuller longer and you'll lose weight as a result. So um, instead of using like white bread, eating white bread or English muffins, go for a whole wheat pasta. Um, also, same thing with like whole milk. Instead of the whole milk, choose like the soy or fat-free, skim or one percent varieties. Uh, when dining out, like if you're looking at the menu and stuff says like fried, obviously no, big no-no. <laughs> uh, even if it says pan-fried, it's actually they, they use a bunch of a lot of oil. And if you the preparation says sauté, you know that there's a fair amount of oil being used. And um, instead, like choose like tandoori or like tikka meat, especially like in the Indian restaurants. And um, instead of using like cream-based curries, use like, go for like dry roasted or baked, grilled, broiled or steamed preparations of food and you'll probably be okay and the, you'll get the nutrients. And instead of eating like cakes, cookies, donuts and brownies, uh, fruits are always a good dessert, it's nature's best dessert. And popcorn, actually, surprisingly, popcorn makes it up there because popcorn is made from the seed, it's pot, so it's definitely healthy, but mine is the better. <laughs> and with regards to red meat, um, you know, I think Cindy's in general, like most people in our community don't tend to eat a lot of red meat, but we do tend to eat like more amounts of uh, lamb. But if you eat like lamb or like beef, uh, try switching over to like, definitely switch over to fish or leaner meat, leaner cuts of so we're at YSA, and we can't forget our city culture. So I sort of looked at my own, like I sort of, this is like my own contribution to like what I think is um, what is heart healthy for me. So definitely Sai Baji makes it up there. It's one of my favorites, uh, one of Neil's favorites, and it's good because it has um, you know protein in it. The spinach uh, um, definitely provides uh, the antioxidant effect, and it's, you know definitely, oh excuse me, definitely nutritious. And dal, but without the pakwan, the pakwan is fried, or any kind of puri, so dal is good, another good source of protein and fiber. Uh, sail, mani, sail fish, so this is like mani or fish that's cooked in like a coriander sauce, um, like a chutney sauce, and as long as you use like whole wheat mani, you know, it ends up being a very nutritious meal. Uh, rajma, I put up on there, which is kidney beans, another good source of proteins and fiber. And silly curry, which not the basin kind, but the tomato based kind, which is more the Chicago puri style, um, has actually really good because the tomatoes in it have uh, lycopene, which is 
a good source of antioxidants as well. And I put longer jobarto, which is eggplant bartha or like um, bangan bartha. Uh, again, the vegetables are bangan is really good. And eating koki, like whole wheat koki and dud, like with the fat free dud, is definitely healthy. And using like lean turkey meat when you're making kima, you know, that's also a way to change things. So it's not that hard to actually incorporate these changes. Like when I look at a recipe when I'm cooking dinner, um, like I'll look at how to like you know cut back or how to like change um, some of the recipe, some of the ingredients so that it becomes more healthy. And it's actually not that hard. So it just takes some you know I guess it just takes some knowledge and just uh, doing it enough to recognize what's unhealthy and what's not. So now that we've talked a lot about eating, because we love to eat as a culture, and we're focused always around food, right? So we need to talk a little bit about exercise. So Vijay did a great job this morning with uh, teaching us how to bust our gut. Um, I hope you guys all do out there. <laughs> um, here's a doctor. So if you guys think that you don't have time to exercise, think again. So here's a doctor advising his patient, saying, what fits your busy schedule better, exercising one hour a day or being dead 24 hours a day? I think you know what choice to make. <laughs> so, when I think about exercise, um, especially like exercise that's going to be heart healthy or like you know mitigate your risk of heart disease, I sort of, sort of tend to break it up in two components. So one is like the cardiovascular component of exercise, which is like the aerobic part, which is utilizes oxygen oxygen directly, and the other part is strength training, which is like building muscle. So that's anaerobic exercise. You still utilize oxygen, but indirectly. So. Examples of cardiovascular exercise, anything that gets your heart rate up. I mean, kickboxing, hiking, walking, running, swimming, any sport, you know, whatever you like to do. And the Nintendo Wii does not count, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I haven't tried the Wii Fit, but uh, I don't know. I'd, I'd be a little skeptical, but I don't think it probably wouldn't provide as much benefit. Um, and when I think of strength training, it's like anything that incorporates like free weights, machines, or like resistance bands into your workout. Um, something where you're developing muscle. So why this is good is because with, if you're thinking about weight loss, it's good to incorporate cardiovascular and strength training into your workout because that way you'll get the most benefits. Not only will you become toned and lose weight, like you'll look good. So, and, and the muscles actually, uh, building muscle is important. Uh, you don't need to bulk up, ladies, but you know, at least like if you do some kind of resistance exercise, uh, you'll actually uh, be challenging your muscles and you actually burn more fat that way because as you build muscle, the way the muscles regain their, um, uh, their you know, they rebuild their fibers is actually by burning fat. So they use, utilize fat as a fuel source. So that's really important. And when you're thinking about, okay, so how much should I be doing with the exercise and all this stuff, like, so with, the, with the regards to cardiovascular exercise, think the acronym FIT. So frequency stands for like how often you do the exercise, intensity stands for how long, how vigorously you do it, and time um, obviously refers to how long you do it. So with regards to cardiovascular exercise, at least, you know, good rule of thumb is at least, um, you know, five to seven days a week for about, you know, at, you should be exercising at a pace where you feel like it's hard to carry on a conversation. Like you can carry on a conversation, but it's like really tough. So that's sort of like your, you obviously should be uh, achieving your target heart rate. That's a little bit technical, but you know, a non-technical <laughs> way of judging how vigorously you're doing your exercise is by saying, you know, if you can, carry on a conversation but finding it difficult to complete your sentences, you, you know that you're at a good pace. And with time, like I would say like 60 to 90 minutes a day is really good. And with regards to weight training, I think 8 to 12 reps, uh, 1 to 2 sets, like alternating between 2 to 3 days a week is really good for, you know, you don't need to be doing it uh, every day necessarily because your body needs to uh, build, you know, needs, needs a break in between so you should be alternating cardiovascular and strength training. So on the days when you do like you're running, you know, so the next day you should be like at the gym like working on the weights, so. Okay. So now that we've talked like all about, you know, you know, the statistics and prevalence of heart disease, we talked about risk factors, we talked about diet, we talked about how to change, moder change our fitness around. Um, some of the key, like I think some of the key early prevention strategies are you know, if you haven't already done so, get your cholesterol checked. Know where you stand. I mean, know what your numbers are. And if you don't know what they mean, ask your doctor or ask a PA. You know, that's, where, that's why we're here, to help, 
help you guide and help you understand. And make sure, like, say if you are diagnosed with high, high heart um, uh, hypertension or cholesterol, uh, see a doctor regularly for checkups. So make sure that you know that you're being treated and things are going appropriately. Like, don't just like lose follow up. Uh, we have some patients that we do surgery and they like never come to their post-operative appointment. And I sort of find that concerning. It's like, hello, you had a big surgery done. Like, don't you want to like see your surgeon and see like make sure that like you're doing okay? Like that that sort of makes common. You think it's common sense, but many people are like, oh, I'm fixed. I'm okay. I don't need to go back. So. Keep that relationship ongoing. Um, if you don't like fish particularly, like if you don't like the taste of fish or if you're vegetarian, uh, a good alternative is to take like fish oil supplements. Um, these are available in tablet form. Uh, typically, a, a one gram a day is pretty good in terms of providing substantial benefits. And if you don't like fruits or vegetables, taking multivitamin day also is okay. But I would recommend uh, intake of the natural you know, source of these to uh, Supplements. So, if you take it in naturally, you probably will get most benefit. And eliminate smoking. You know, lose weight and limit your alcohol intake. Incorporate a heart healthy diet, which is high in fiber, low in fat, high in protein. Incorporate one to two uh, fish meals a week, and uh, incorporate you know whole grains into your diet. And eat lots of fruits and vegetables, and drink lots of water too. Water is really good for uh, eliminating toxins, flushing out toxins from your body, and make sure you work out regularly too. So, um, you know, incorporating cardio and strength training into your exercise. All right, so now that I've uh, sort of gone through and given you like an overview of everything, uh, I think it's time to test your knowledge and see how, how much you guys have been paying attention. So we're gonna, I'm gonna ask you three, set three questions and you guys will get, if you guys get the right answer, uh, the prize that you get is a $5 Starbucks gift card. So it's a nice, sweet deal, so well, uh, don't be shy to raise your hand, okay? All right, next slide. Okay, quiz number one. One third of all heart attacks occur in people, A, less than 45, B, 46 to 65, or C, 66 and above. Please raise your hand. A, that's right. Good, good job. Give them, give them a round of applause. Wow, you guys have been really paying attention. Wow, that's great. Okay, all right, that's correct. Less than 45, so that's, that's the yeah, magic number. Okay, quiz number two. <laughs> all of these are refined foods except, go ahead, A, cakes, B, pizza, C, donuts, D, muffins, or E, popcorn. You with the glasses. That's right. Wow. I, I thought I'd have to sit here and like fight with you the gift cards. Good job. Yes, E is right. That's right. Popcorn is healthy. Okay. Last but not the least, um, all of these are benefits of exercise except number one, lose weight. B, increase stress. C, increase good cholesterol. <laughs> oh my god, you guys have your hands up already. Or D, strengthen heart muscle. Or E, lower blood pressure. You over there, you look like you're dying to raise your hand. You look yellow. <laughs> I'm sorry? B. B, yes, you're right. Do you know why? Do you know why? You in the red. <laughs> Give her a gift card. Just. Wait, 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 wait. Did you answer the question? Did you answer why it increases stress? No, you, you have to increase. Yeah, why does it increase stress? That's right. Give her a round of applause. She gets a gift card. Good job. That's right. You're a pharmacist, yeah, by the way. You guys did great. I'm, I'm proud of you guys. Awesome. Okay, so. Uh, and here, actually, I want to, before I end, I actually want to, this picture was actually taken at uh, last year, on May the 9th, is it correct? I can't believe I forgot the date. Uh, this is actually me and Neil at our first half marathon. We, prior to actually doing this, we actually did a half marathon with uh, Team in Training. It's an organization that helps fight Leukemia and Lymphoma Society 
by um, training people who don't know how to run, like how to run in marathons and participate. So prior to participating in this, uh, both Neil and I never really like ran that much. Like we'd run like maybe like one or two miles, like three times a week, like you know. But really, like we needed like a lot of discipline, and sometimes we found it really hard to like exercise. And we sort of found out about this organization. We said, what a great way to get involved and to help and give back to the community. But at the same time, we, you know, we both got a chance to really test out our you know, patience and our determin determination. Like it took a lot of time and a lot of effort to training into this. And uh, you know, I think we were just so like, supported by this uh, Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. They're a great organization. They provide a lot of support and resource and they're just so um, positive and they're out there with you, training with you. And I found it such a great, great experience that I can't express how much I'm indebted to them that I was actually so happy that I was able to run my first half marathon. So I ran 13.2 miles, going from running one or two miles. So I could not have done that without Neil, so Neil's my partner in crime. <laughs> and uh, you know, I just and actually it goes on to show, like actually last year, last October, we did our second half marathon. So I, I hope to keep running more marathons. I hope uh, Neil will keep running them with me. And uh, I, I encourage you guys to get out there, get involved, and you know, at the same time, make a change and give back to your community. So with that, I'd like to wish you all a great, great retreat. Have fun. Uh, I can't wait to party with you and dance with you on the dance floor. And, and I wish you a great, happy, healthy, heart healthy 2008. Thank you very much.